In chapter 5, Paul dealt a great deal with the uh, difference between those that are in Adam and those that are in Christ. Those that are in Adam are in the old nature, or the old way, the, the sinful self. Those that are in Christ have been set free from that. And then he goes on and he moves in and he talks about how, how grace is so far above and beyond what the, the problem of sin is, that it is, it is exceedingly and abundant more than we can ever hope or imagine what Jesus has for us. That the, this grace that is poured out um, the, in, the, in the Greek, when you look at the word context, it comes, it's not just abundant, it's super abundant, meaning above and beyond all that's necessary. So if sin was uh, a faucet that was turned on, grace would be a flood that washed that whole, the whole house away. It's the, the, the increase in that is what he wanted to get us to understand. So whenever you look at that and you consider that, it comes to the point where he goes in chapter 6 here, where what are we trying to get at? What am I trying to say whenever I want you to understand this truth about God's grace? What is it that we need to do and how do we need, need to live in light of that? And those are the things that he's going to deal with here. So let's just take a look at Romans 6.1. Paul jumps right in where he says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? Now, this is going back to Romans 5.20, which says that the law was brought so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So we've kind of covered a little bit of that as uh, we're looking here at, at uh, verse 1. But really what he's getting at is this. The question comes down to, well, if God is so wonderful and he is given honor by washing away the sins, why don't we give him more sin to wash away and he can receive more honor? That's kind of the gist of where everybody's going with on that. And it's not really, I say everybody, I say this imagined person. Paul has probably has dealt with this personally. And so he just he's writing it into this letter to the Roman church to, to let them know that this is a thought. This is something that I have had to deal with. So this thought comes, and this is how I'm going to answer that. So this thing about letting uh, sin just increase so that grace can increase is absolutely a contradiction. It cannot be that way. It goes on to say that, uh, well, let's take for instance here. If a person was to continue in sin after they know Jesus, what does that tell us? Just think about that for a minute. Let's take a look at 2 Corinthians 13.5. So this, Paul tells the believers this, and this really gets, gets me in a little bit of trouble with the people that want to really argue between the difference between a, a Calvinistic point of view and an Arminian point of view. Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? Now, we can remember whenever we went through the series through the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus was saying there, well, that there's going to be many that come to him on that day and say, Lord, Lord. And he's going to say, depart from me, for I never knew you. Right? So there's going to be a lot of people, brothers and sisters, that go to church every Sunday, that go through the motions of being a Christian, that know the right things to say, that attend and pay a tithe and do all the right things, do all the right things the way that, quote, unquote, church people are supposed to do. But then it's going to come down to this. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? So test yourselves. How do you test yourselves? What are we to do? What are we to look at? How are we to examine ourselves to see if we really are in Christ? Christ really is in us. And we have that union with him. How do we go about that? And I got to ask, does, does that bring to your mind a question? Does that make you ponder for yourselves where you may stand? Does that make you want to take a moment and do some self-examination? I think there's a lot of people in the Christian church today, where, wherever they are, whatever denomination, whatever they, they are located in the country and around the world, there's a lot of people out there that really need to take something like this seriously. Because it's not just what you come from your mouth, but it's what comes from your heart. And that's where God's going to be looking, is right here on the inside. 
And so that's why it's important to test ourselves to see if we're there. Are we really doing everything for God? Or are we still living for ourselves? Are we focused on doing the things that God wants us to do and live in a godly way and try to bring honor to the name of God as we claim to be his children? Or are we doing everything the way that we want to? We want to show up at church and get some fire insurance, but then we want to live the way we want to whenever we go every other day of the week. What is it that's really in our hearts? That's where God's going to be looking. And we can fool each other. We can fool other people in the world. And you've probably seen it as different ones I've mentioned it before. There's a big movement in the uh, Christian circles now of deconstructing the faith, people that have claimed to be Christians. And you see this primarily out of people that are celebrities of some sort, music or television or internet celebrities or what have you. And then they make this big announcement about how they're leaving the faith and, and they've just come to realize that, it, that there, was, there was whatever the deal is. Okay, the problem is this. Those people were going through the motions and a lot of people held them up as examples because they did the right things. But when push come to shove, they were never changed on the inside. They never were. Right? The heart change didn't happen. Because if you've got that heart change, you're not interested in the things in the world anymore. So when you test yourself, you're testing your heart. You're looking at what's on the inside. Paul's going to get more into this. I'm, I've already kind of hung there longer than I intended to. But Paul's going to get into this as we look through the rest of these verses this morning. Let's take a look at Jude, verse 4. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. There are people that claim to be Christians in the church, even yet today, that do this very thing. If you pay attention, if you watch what's going on, you can see the fighting in denominations, you can see the struggle that's going on there, and they are trying to bring in all the sin of the world into the church. And there is a stark warning about that. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality. See, this superabundant grace is to cover your sin so that your sin is dealt with, so that you can walk right with God. The purpose is to walk right with God. Now, how many people in the Christian church think that once you kneel at this altar and say a, a prayer that, God, forgive me for my sin, okay, hey, I must be good, and you get up and you leave and you go about your business like you always have, and you're still doing the same things you've always done. I can't even tell you how many times I've seen people do that and then come back years later and think that they're all right or because they were saved as a small child and they've lived like the devil ever since that they're still going to be able to get into heaven. They made a confession, but there was no change. Are you guys following along with me here? There has to be a change on the inside. Now, I, there's always those that have been in church their entire lives that were raised up. You know, I've got my own children that from the time that they could open their eyes, you bring them in when they know nothing but going to church. So they may not know what the sins of the world are and what all those things are, but there still comes a point where they have to surrender themselves to God and make a choice for themselves. Not because mom and dad took me to church every Sunday, not because I, I know that that's the things that I'm supposed to say and that I'm expected to say, but they have to make a choice for themselves that I choose. I choose for me to surrender my life to Jesus. They still have to have that moment. Now, maybe the, the shift may not be as big from leaving all the sins of the, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll out in the world to, you know, someone that's been in church all their life. You may not have as big a shift, but there still needs to be an inward change, an inward focus towards God and not self. And that's what he's going for here. A lot of people that try to balance these two things here that he's talking about going on sinning so that grace may abound, they don't understand that if you continue to sin, there's some certain consequences that go with that. It breaks your fellowship with God. 
It gets in the way. You'll know that if you continue to live in sin, it will become harder and harder to pray. If you're trying to live in sin and you think you can balance both worlds, you'll find that you're drifting further away from God every moment of every day because it gets harder to pray and harder to have any kind of relationship with God. It damages your, <clears throat> your relationship with your brethren. It gets in the way of your relationship with brothers and sisters because there's always that little fear in the back of your mind that someone may find out, I may slip up and say something, and someone may find out what it is that I've been doing. So it damages your relationship. So you can't have the unity that you need to have with your brothers and sisters or with God. It causes inward guilt. It, makes us, uh, it turns us into absolute hypocrites. It slows you down. It makes it where you can't do anything. But it also gives the enemies of Jesus ammunition that they can use against the church whenever it's found out. And brothers and sisters, it will be found out. You got these people that are walking away, but you got others that have been that just blow up things because of some sin in their life. You, you know, there was a, here a while back. It seemed like there was a, a whole bunch of people that were real big in TV ministries. That uh, was something was this stuff was found out about what they'd been doing behind the scenes and all that. And then that causes all the people that were following their ministries to begin to question whether their salvation is real or authentic or not because they see that the leader of that movement, whatever whoever it was, they've fallen to sin. And it destroys everything, and then it wrecks the people around them, and it gives the enemies of the gospel ammunition that they can use against people. So walking in sin is not conducive to walking with Christ. And that's why he goes so emphatically here in verse 2 to say, by no means. And then he goes on to explain there's a reason for this. Now, by no means should there, you continue any further. We... Who are, <clears throat> we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? We are those who have died to sin. Before you knew Jesus, you were dead in sin, dead to God. Now you are alive to God, but dead to sin. Right? If you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you have been made alive to God but now you are dead to sin. We have died to sin. Have you ever really stopped to consider what that means? If you have died, what happens? What are your cares for this world whenever you leave this earthly coil, well, with this tabernacle, this body that we have? When your soul leaves here, what are your worldly concerns at that point? You have none, right? You have no concerns. You're worried about what's coming after. You're not worried about what was. That's the same way that he wants us to think about this idea of sin. So the, the sins that bothered us, whatever, you know, gambling, drinking, uh, you know, whatever it was that you, you struggled with in the flesh, whenever you're in Jesus, you have died to that thing. So there should no longer be any concern to you. But you have now been made alive to something far greater far beyond anything else. That's that di distinction, that separation that needs to be in there. That's where you're going to find that test, is where your heart really is focused. He calls upon Christians not to die to sin because we have already died to sin in Jesus. So that's what he's getting at here. He says, don't you know, in verse 3, that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now, I'm going to hang on the baptized for just a minute. Because I do use this whenever we have our baptism services. But he's not particularly talking about here the actual water baptism. Okay? That's not what he's talking about. Baptism does not save you. Baptism is a symbol and a sign of what has already happened as you're, you've been unified with Jesus whenever you've become born again. So once you have become saved, you're already saved at that point. Your baptism then is an outward sign to everybody that you identify with Christ. Now, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For we are we're all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Okay? First Corinthians, he kind of gets along that same idea of baptism, right? We were all baptized by one spirit to form one body. His baptism he's talking about is you're leaving behind one thing and being joined to another. That's what that baptizo, that's what, that, that's what he's referring to there when you go back into the Greek, is it's 
making one thing of no effect so that you can be uh, connected to something new. That's the process that's in that. So the idea is this, that as you have died to sin and been connected to Jesus, you've been baptized into Jesus. And that baptism into Jesus is a union. Just like we celebrated when we took communion just a second ago. It's a union between you and the eternal Son of God. Now I want you to stop and just consider that for just a moment. You, as a born-again child of God, have been joined together with Jesus. So much so that when the Father sees us, when we stand in judgment, he sees Jesus instead of us. That's how we can have the imputed righteousness of Christ. That's how he has given us his righteous life so that we would be able to stand before the Father. That is why we have the access to the throne. I talked about that a few weeks ago. The glorious access that whenever we go in prayer, we go before the throne of grace in prayer. We can walk right into the throne room of God and make our request known. Why? Because we are in Jesus. That's what he's talking about there with that baptism. I don't know why. I always have to have a weird accent when I try to say Greek words. I don't know why that is. <clears throat> we were therefore, in verse 4, therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. That ought to be just about the way that it is, huh? Nothing more needs to be said about that. We have been so identified with Christ. The death that he, that he endured for us on the cross was the death that we owed for the penalty of sin. He died for us. But because he had no sin, death couldn't hold him. And so he was able to throw off the shackles of death and rise again. His resurrection, right? Raised to new life. But brothers and sisters, we have been bonded, baptized into Jesus in such an extent that even though the death that he suffered for us is a shared death, our death to sin, we also get to partake in the new life whenever he was raised up. See, the union with Jesus doesn't change. It doesn't go away. It doesn't shift. Once you have been bonded to Jesus, you have been bonded to Jesus. Right? The only question is, is are you going through the motions of being a Christian without ever having the bonding happen to Jesus Christ? Have you surrendered yourself to him in a way that you could be identified with him in his death, his burial, and his resurrection? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? That is our test. That's what Paul's getting at. That's what he's driving at here. This is the test that we need to make our own hearts it ought to be, I, I really think that it ought to be something that we take seriously whenever we consider that Jesus said that he is going to tell those, there's going to be a lot of people that come to him and he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. But they think that they're all right. In their own minds, they think that they're okay. That's why it is so important that we get this right. So we have been bonded with him. We have been joined with Jesus in his death his burial, and his resurrection. And then through the glory of the Father, we too have this new life. Now, in verse 5, For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. I want to go back to my, one of my favorite verses, if not the favorite verse I have in all of Scripture, Galatians 2.20. Paul writes this, speaking of his own unity with Jesus. He says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, Paul is talking about all of this from a theological point of view. We've talked about in previous verses in, in, uh, in verse five, or not verse, chapter five, we've talked about the idea of justification and being justified in the eyes of God. He's talking about now is what in theological terms would be sanctification. 
It's this process by which we become more like Jesus. When you realize that you have been bonded to him in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, whenever you realize that all of that's there and you have died to the old way of life and you're no longer bound to that in any way, shape, or form, when all of that begins to sink in, then you begin to realize, I need to live in a way that shows this, that exemplifies this. This is your sanctification. This is your becoming more like Jesus. You should be more like Jesus today than you were yesterday. And way more than you were this time last year. It should be a continual progression towards holiness. It should always be the direction of our lives. That's what he's looking for. Now in verse 6, he's talking about basically the same points but he's talking about it not from a theological point of view, but from an experiential point of view. So in Romans 6, 6, he says, for we know. That's why we're talking about the experience. Because we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. No longer be slaves to sin. Brothers and sisters, how many times have you heard some, someone say, some, some brother or sister in the church that has allowed sin to come into their life and wreak, wreak some kind of havoc for them, destroyed a marriage, uh, wrecked a family, destroyed a business, whatever, because they have allowed some kind of sin in. Have you anybody heard that? And they say that I just couldn't help it. It was just overpowering. It was just, it was beyond me, these circumstances. You ever anybody heard you say anything to that effect? I have from time to time heard people utter such phrases that would give you the idea that this, these, these circumstances that they were in, it was just this whirlwind and, and it couldn't be helped. That absolutely is, is a lie straight from hell. We know that our old self was crucified with him, okay? Our old self, that sinful nature, that part of us that was a slave to sin that couldn't help but sin, that part is dead, in, cru in the crucifixion of Jesus, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That done away with, it's gone. It's, it's made to null and void. It's no longer effective. So that we should no longer be slaves to sin. We are no longer under the power of sin. They know what that means? That means that when sin just happens and it overwhelms you, it's because you chose it. That's exactly what that means. That means that you chose to sin. You made a willful choice in the moment to do the thing that you know that God did not want you to do. You chose to sin. So there is no overwhelming, uh, being swept over kind of thing where, where Satan just, can, can just overwhelms you and, and all of this stuff happens and you just slip and fall into sin. No. It is a process by which sin is offered to you and you dwell on it until the point where you decide to act on it. You allow it to have control over you because it no longer has dominion over you if you are a born-again child of God. That, I'm not, what I'm saying is, is we are not going to be perfect, but if we do sin, we do sin by choice. Are we getting what that means? There's no excuses. There's no reason there is nothing to hide behind. Sin is a choice if you are a born-again child of God. If you're overwhelmed and you just can't help it, then you were never a child of God. Make sense? It's just that simple. Once again, a reason to look and examine and make sure that you're in the faith. Check your own heart and make sure you know where you stand. We have this experience because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. 
If you have died to self, if you have died to the old person who you were, then that, that sin has no hold on you anymore. Whatever covenant relationship there was between Adam and a sin nature is dead because of Christ, because he's made all of that brand new. You are not the same way that you were before. So if you are a born-again child of God, don't ever act like God has allowed that to happen. You have made a decision, and now you're going to have to face the consequences for it. Once again, we come back to the place where we say, praise God that he has this super abundant grace. Because as long as we draw breath, you still have the opportunity to get right with God. If you die in your sin, you're going to die in your sin. But brothers and sisters, you can draw on breath. You have the opportunity to ask forgiveness for that and to get your heart right with God. And that's all that it takes. He's right there waiting for you if you have any struggles that you're dealing with. He goes on in verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. And we've already kind of covered that, but basically it's the same thing. We know this. We understand this, that we've died to sin. Sin no longer has power over us unless we give it power, unless we choose to go that way. But because we've been set free from sin, we now have the freedom to live a life for God. And because we have a freedom to live a life for God, we realize that we live in the resurrection of Jesus. We realize what the old self gone there is a brand new self in Jesus. And that is that overwhelming feeling. I don't know, brothers and sisters, if you got to experience that, but that was my experience at salvation. It was just that it just washing over you feeling of being something set free and new and shackles falling off and, and being able to, to realize that there is so much more that you just couldn't even perceive until all of that was washed away. I can tell you right now, that if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, you are being blinded by the enemy and you cannot perceive all of the beauty and the grace and the grandeur that is around you, that is the creation of God, because the enemy will not let you see it. He is trying to keep you wrapped in change and to keep your head down, because that is all that he can do. But if you are willing to give your heart to Jesus, if you are willing to surrender to him, he will break every chain that binds you. He will set you free. And whenever your spirit is set free, there is such a sense of relief and joy that it's overwhelming that comes upon you. And in that freedom, you get to realize everything that's around you and the beauty that it is. The word of God will open up to you and you'll begin to read truths in that Bible that you didn't think were possible. And that is the experience whenever your heart and your mind are opened up to God. It is a glorious time and something to be relished. <clears throat> if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. And that's another thing that we can hang on to right there. Because we've been bonded to Christ, because we've been baptized into Christ. And he suffered death for us. And death couldn't hold him, and he was raised up to new life. His, he, his, he was resurrected. But brothers and sisters, we get to share in that. And because we've already shared in the resurrection, this is, and this goes back into another grammatical thing, and you get it whenever, excuse me, if you really know the Greek, which I don't, but I read a lot of commentaries, so whenever you read the commentaries, they always go into that. And the way that the sentence is constructed is, a de is, is an event that took place at a definite period of time and does not need to be repeated. That's the context of that. That's what it means. So that when you're in Jesus, your bonding to him has put your resurrection and your salvation, all that 2,000 years whenever he, ago, whenever he suffered on the cross, and your resurrection happened at that time. So brothers and sisters, right now, you're in Jesus you are walking in resurrection life. Right now, you are walking in that life. Because it has already been done. It was already taken care of some 2,000 years ago when Jesus rose from the dead. When he came out of that grave, when he came out of that tomb, that resurrection life became available to all of us that would ever come to know him as Lord and Savior. So that's where we're at. You cannot die. Death no longer has mastery over him. No longer does it have mastery over him. It no longer has mastery over us. Does that mean that this mortal form will, will live forever? No. 
That means that we'll shake this off one day and we'll just we'll be instantly in a glorified body, and that is all that we'll know. Because death has no victory over us. Death has no sting, brothers and sisters, because of what Jesus has done. Verse 10, the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. He lives to God. Brothers and sisters, this is where it gets to that he wants us to understand. All of these things, and Jesus himself, the eternal son, the life that he lives, everything that he did while he was here on earth was focused on the Father, and the life that he's now living is still focused on the Father. And because he's living that life, that's the life that we're expected to live as well. We are now alive, not to sin. We're dead to sin. We're now alive to God. And if we're alive to God, that is where all our hope and all our focus and all our attention should be is on the things of God. And when our, and all of our ability is focused on the things of God, imagine what we're going to be able to do in service to him. When we quit worrying about the things of this world and the weight of the burdens that this world tries to put on us, when we quit worrying about those things and start worrying about the things of God and focusing on him and letting his blessings flow upon us because we're serving him the way that we're supposed to, what is he going to be able to do through us? to affect his kingdom and affect the lives of people, that, to give you the words to say in the right moment to be able to help someone to see past the blinders that the enemy has used for so many years and that you can watch their chains being stri stripped away from them and they will be set free. Brothers and sisters, are we ready to surrender our lives in that way to him? 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul's kind of saying the same thing here, that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In Christ, tied together with him. In Philippians 2.13, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. It is God within us. Jesus, as a member of the Trinity, is God. God within us, us in Christ, us in God. All of that unity. Well, <clears throat> I, just, I can't find the right words to express that. But we're brought into a unification with the Trinity in the person of Jesus. We are blended with Jesus in such a way that we're brought into a unity with the Trinity of God. Does that strike anybody the way that strikes me? I just got to stop and think about that for a minute. I, I, it just blows my mind whenever I consider that. And I think, you know what, for so many years of my life, even as a Christian for so many years of my life, I've lived it just like, ah, I just got to trudge my way through. I got to just keep walking through hip deep snow every step of the way, trying to, to get to the, the finish line someday. But that's not the way that it is. Because God is in us, giving us the strength and the ability to overcome any obstacle. He's going to put you up on top of that snow. You're going to walk on top of that because it ain't going to matter. Anybody here watch Lord of the Rings? You know where the elf walks on top of the snow? It's going to be like that. Everyone else is trying to plow through it, and he's up on top of it walking. We're going to be like that. I'm silly cultural reference, but anyway, that's the part that you're supposed to forget. But, uh, <laughs> but to, to realize all that we have in that, that he is in us right now, giving us everything that we need to will, to have our will overcome any old sinful fleshly desire that may still be hanging on, stringing on with us, his will is there to act in order to fulfill his good purpose, to give you everything because he has given you certain tasks to do. God has jobs for us to do here. He didn't leave us here so that we could just sit around and twiddle our thumbs until he comes back. There are things that we need to do as an occupying force in this world until he comes back to take his complete dominion, right? So as his people, as the children of God, as born-again believers in Jesus Christ, we are to be active in what? Sharing the gospel. Everywhere that we go, sharing the gospel. That's what we're to do. Because everywhere that we go, we take the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. When we fully comprehend everything that we have in Jesus, and we are excited about it to go out and share it with other people, they're going to get excited about it too. And when they get excited about hearing it, guess what? They may decide 
to become a child of God as well. They may give up that old self, surrender themselves to Jesus, become bonded to him, be raised to new life and get that excitement, that cleansing excitement that comes from serving God in that way. Brothers and sisters, we take the gospel everywhere that we go. We need to live it and show it in every way. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin. This is what he's saying here in verse 11. Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, for a lot of us, and I have to say there's been times whenever I have fallen into this, not really considering dead to sin and alive to Christ as a permanent transition, but almost as this thing that you flow back and forth between. Has anybody ever kind of had that thought? Because t different times, different struggles come your way and different things come to entice you and all that. And so you have this thing. So whenever you, you sin, and I'll just, I, I just got to say this. Lord, forgive me. I uh, worked construction for a lot of years. I worked around some rough places and rough people. And I have a certain habit of language that uh, I struggle with. And I am not proud of it. I am ashamed to say it. But I catch myself whenever I really get frustrated and my temper gets short, that my mouth says things that shouldn't be said. And I know, because I know the way I feel instantly afterwards, that that is sin. For me to use foul language the way that I sometimes have, do, or will and no longer, is sin. Because I've got such a conviction about those things. But as I've been studying this and really looking at this, we have to realize this dead to sin thing is your permanent position. This, uh, this thing that I struggle with there with my, my, uh, my words is come to my realization is the choice that I make in that moment. And it's not right. Now, some people, that may seem like nothing, and maybe you've never struggled with that, but it's just a, a pattern that, uh, and a habit, and I'm making excuses, and I don't need to make excuses. I just need to confess and, and be done with this. But we do this thing where we get this idea of uh, where it says, we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness, right? So if we sin, I'll just ask for forgiveness. Or I can't ask for forgiveness. Or Lord, I, I've let this get out of hand, and now I'm coming before you, and I'm asking you to forgive me for this thing. Right? You guys are making me feel like I'm the only one that's ever been there. Whew. I'm about to make a preacher sweat. All right. <clears throat> But what he's getting at here in 11, if we understand this and we know this and we really live this, if we counted ourselves dead to it, dead to all of that before, see, asking for forgiveness will correct an issue, but doing this will prevent an issue. You see the difference? So instead of having to correct something that we've done wrong, we can prevent doing wrong by remembering that we are dead to sin but alive to God, bonded to Jesus Christ. If we can remember that, we cut it off at the past, we cut it off before it ever happens. We are dead to all of the old ways and we are now alive to a brand new way in Jesus. And you no longer have to worry about <clears throat> those things, about what you've been doing or what you've been saying, because God has already taken care of it. It's already been dealt with on the cross, and you don't have to struggle with it anymore here. 
Just remember that you can do it beforehand and not after. He goes on in verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Therefore, okay, this is your part. This is what you need to do. We've talked about what Jesus has done. We've talked about your position in Jesus as a child of God, being a born-again Christian. We've talked about all of those things. Now he wants to tell us what it is that we need to do. Therefore, do not let, you want to underline that word, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. We still have to have this mortal body right now, but it is no longer in control because Jesus Christ has set us free. It is not in control of us. This does not control us. But the Spirit of God does. And with the Spirit of God controlling you, you don't have anything else to worry about. So that's why he stresses that point. Do not let sin reign. Because that's what we would be doing. That's what I have done. I have let sin reign at different times. And then had to go back on my knees and ask forgiveness for it. Brothers and sisters, he is calling us to live a life beyond that, above that, where that is no longer an issue for us. In verse 13, he goes on to say, and this is more that we're to do, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. That includes our lips, our words, our, 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 the things that we say every part of ourselves. We offer that. The whole idea of the offering is laying it before somebody so that they can have use of it. So when you offer somebody, I offer somebody to use my hammer drill, right? I've got a nice hammer drill and I don't offer it to just anybody. <laughs> you offer somebody to use your hammer drill, that person gets to take in to use the hammer drill, right? So you're offering that. So when you offer yourselves to sin, you are literally giving yourself to that to sin to use. That's what you're doing. But he says, don't do that anymore. You've died to that. Now offer yourself to God so that God can take and use you. God can do something with you. You are in his service now. Don't offer to yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, which we've covered extensively, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. That, brothers and sisters, is what he expects of his people. That's what he expects of every single one of us that call him Lord. That we offer ourselves to God to be used as an instrument of righteousness. To be an example of for the people in the world that are looking and watching to see if we live different than anybody else or if we just do like everybody else does. If there's any difference in what we're talking about, about being in Jesus or just going on with the way things are out there in the rest of the world where nobody cares about Jesus. Brothers and sisters, are we surrendering ourselves to God to be used by him as instruments of righteousness? Now, I got a couple of verses I want to share because I just want to back this up with everything here. But in other places in Scripture, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Right? So Paul is saying the exact same here to the Corinthian church that he's saying to the Roman church. Honor God with everything that you are. Everything that you are should be surrendered to God. Titus 2.14, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Those good works that he has already prepared for us to do, we are eager to do them because we have surrendered ourselves so completely to him He's redeemed us from all wickedness and purified us for his use. That's the life that he's calling us to. That's the measure that he is, has, has laid upon us. And he verse says in verse 14, for sin. Now, if all of this comes together for, that's what this, that word for is bringing all this together. For sin shall no longer be your master. 
because you are not under the law, but under grace. Because the grace of God has covered every aspect of that, has washed you clean, and you have been set free. Brothers and sisters, let's live the life that he has called us to live in the gracious glory of Jesus Christ.